Hi, welcome to John's Tech and Travel. Today we're going to talk about cargo trailer controversies. You can tell I'm standing in my cargo trailer right now and you might hear the gentle pitter-patter of the rain on the roof. But that's what we have, so that's what we're going to work with today. Today I want to talk about six cargo trailer controversies. These are things that I see on Facebook sites, YouTube channels where people are discussing things and giving their opinions and sometimes those opinions are in conflict with other people's opinions. Well, I'm going to address each one of these and uh, give you hopefully a well-balanced view and then I'm going to tell you my take, what I did and how it might best apply to your situation. So stay tuned. Here we go. The first controversy we'll discuss is Aluminum versus steel. This is the first one you're going to run into when you are buying a, a cargo trailer. Which are you going to get? Both have their advantages, both have their disadvantages. Aluminum trailers are lighter by 10 to 15 percent by the same size. At least that's what one source says on the internet that I found. And I think that's generally true. The weight of the trailer is important when you're going to also be deciding what type of tow vehicle you need. Are you going to be able to get by with that F-150 or are you going to need a 250 or 350? Um, the, you know, the bigger the trailer, the heavier that it is, the bigger the tow vehicle you're going to need. So this is a pretty important topic. One of the advantages of aluminum is that aluminum doesn't rust. Still does. Um, however, aluminum does oxidize, which is really, you know, kind of rust. Uh, really rust on steel is oxidation of the steel and aluminum also oxidizes but it's nowhere near as destructive. If you ever want to see aluminum oxide go to a piece of bare aluminum, not one that's coated but a piece of bare aluminum just run your hand down it you'll see black stuff on your hand that's aluminum oxide. Steel trailers tend to be less expensive than aluminum trailers and so that of course is a very important consideration. Uh, when I was looking I think that I could have bought the same size of steel trailer for a considerably less amount. I decided to go with aluminum but that's a personal choice of mine. One of the controversies here is that steel is easier to repair than aluminum and it seems that every time I see a discussion about this on Facebook or on YouTube, people say, oh, you can't find people who can, who can weld aluminum. I'm not so sure that's true. I've been in industry most of my life, and I think there are a lot of people who are very competent at welding aluminum. In fact, um, I'm pretty sure that you can get certifications in just doing that, and any well-respected welding shop is probably going to have people who can do it for you. Uh, it doesn't seem particularly difficult to do, and most welding shops are going to have the equipment uh, and the materials necessary to make any repair that you might have. Part of this controversy involves north versus south, or northeast perhaps, versus the rest of the United States. Um, because here in the northeast, I live in Pennsylvania, here in the northeast, we use a lot of salt on roads to clear them in the wintertime to get rid of ice and snowpack. Uh, we don't want that on our highways, so we put down liberal amounts of salt, which can eat steel up very quickly. Aluminum isn't so much affected by that, but either way, I, I don't think that's a huge controversial point. It shouldn't be anyway. If you're maintaining your trailer, if you're keeping it in good shape, if you're inspecting it often, like you should be, I mean, it is a vehicle that you need, and it's a big investment, um, you're probably not going to have problems. Also, if your trailer is 3,000 pounds gross vehicle weight or more, you have to have it inspected here in Pennsylvania. A uh, yearly inspection is required, and they're going to they're gonna let you know if that's a problem. But what can you do? Well, you can take a look at your trailer, and you should take a look at your trailer's frame regularly. When you're able to, scooch underneath or find somebody who's able to do that for you and look very carefully for any signs of corrosion or breakage. That should be something you do on a regular basis. You want your trailer to be in perfect condition, so take the time to do that inspection. It's your safety is very important. Like I said, I live here in the Northeast. A uh, lot of salt on the roads, steel does rust, but when I go to trailer sales companies, what I see is a whole lot of steel trailers there and some aluminum trailers. They do make both. And they do sell both, even in salty, wintry areas, so I wouldn't let that be one of my major concerns. My take? It's aluminum all the way. I like aluminum far better than steel. I like that lighter, 
approach. I like the, the feel of aluminum. I like the thought of it, I guess. Um, we're just kind of prejudiced that way. That's what I'm going with. I'm going aluminum all the way. Controversy number two, stranded wire versus solid wire. I've seen a number of sources, both uh, social media and YouTube, that say very specifically that you cannot use solid wire in a cargo trailer. I don't believe that's true. I have never seen anything in any code, any vehicle specifications that says you can't use solid wire. You're basically building a tiny house here, and if you have wire specifically, I have, I have receptacles back here that are 110 volts. I have a little entrance box down below the counter here for 30 amp entrance. In my walls back through the trailer, I have 110 volt receptacles. They have, they're wired with solid wire. Now, if you know of some place where it says you can't do that, put it in the comments down below along with a specific location in some code that says you're not allowed to do that. And I'll, I'll retract this, um, but I believe that it's perfectly okay. For those of you who are doing 110 volt wiring in a trailer or anywhere, the important thing is that you know how to make a good connection make those connections properly. My concern with using stranded wire for 110 volts is that it's very difficult to do. Technically, if you're going to make the connection with stranded wire, you should tin those wires. You should put a coat of solder on those wires so that all the strands are bound together. Then you can bend them into that U-shape that you put around the screw to make a good connection. What I see way too often is when people are using stranded wires, they put it under the screw, they crank down tight on it, and the wires just kind of splay all over the place. That's not the way you want to do it. That's not a good practice. Don't do that. For my DC, always stranded wire because I'm usually stringing it around. It's not as protected um, and often things are moving. For example, I have a lift bed. On my lift bed I have power not to run a motor but to run lights that are under the lift bed. So that when the bed's up I can have a table underneath if I want and uh, have some light to, to play cards or play a game under there. Um, so that's stranded wire certainly. Anything is going to be moving uh, in relation to each other that you want stranded wire for. Uh, my, my lights up here, my, my, um, my controls in different places, all strand of wire because it's really easy to run. Plus I need, I want it to be flexible. So that's a good choice. So generally I'm going to say you can use solid wire for 110 volts. You probably should use stranded wire for 12 volts. Cargo trailer controversy number three, composting toilet versus chemical toilet versus RV toilet with a black tank. I don't know that this is so much of a controversy as it is just a personal decision based on the style that you want. So I'm going to start out of order here. I'm going to start with chemical toilets. Don't like them. Don't like them. I'm going to say that straight out. I just really don't like chemical toilets. Um, I don't want to have to mess with chemicals. I, and then you still have to dump it somewhere. You've got to do something with it. I find them to be expensive, complicated, and messy. Black tank. You know, conventional toilet with a black tank. Uh, for some people, that's going to be the answer. If you are boondocking, if you are going to uh, be staying in one place for a long time, it sure is great to have that. But remember, you have to empty that black tank. That's the downside. The choice for me composting. It's right behind this, this curtain over here, by the way. That's a composting toilet in there. Truth is, we bought it, installed it, never used it. We tend to stay at state parks where we are very close to bathhouses, and we always use the bathhouses instead of the toilets. Your decision, but I'm going to say this. If you have a composting toilet, use it as a composting toilet. Mine is a sea head. If you look those up, they have a crank that after you do your business and you put in some, uh, some composting matter, which really just dries it out a little bit, you put in a handle and you stir it up. The idea is then that it composts. I see a lot of people who are taking a plastic bag, putting it in there, they do their business at the end of a trip or at the end of the day or whenever, they take the plastic bag out, they throw it in the trash. If you're going to have a composting toilet, compost. Give Mother Nature a hand here. Um, you know, she has a natural process that allows all this to happen. 
you know, let it happen. Use the composting toilet the way it was intended to be used. Cargo trailer conversion controversy number four. Weight distribution hitches. Should you invest in one? They're kind of expensive, but I think they might be necessary. Every time I see on social media where the question comes up, should I have a weight distribution hitch? There are people who say, ah, you don't need them. I've been doing this for years, never needed one, but there are a number of people out there who know that they said they didn't need one until they wished they had it. Then they become believers. If you're in a windy area, those high winds can be pushing the trailer around and get it starting to oscillate. If you're pushing the edge where your truck may not be quite as heavy as it should be to pull the load, well, when you're on a busy highway and you have this truck zipping past you and the pressure is pushing against the side of your truck and your trailer, you might wish you had a weight distribution hitch. I think they're very important for safety. Their job is to take the load off of the tongue. This stolen directly from the internet, the job of a weight distribution hitch is to even out the weight over the entire vehicle so that both the trailer and the vehicle are more level. This gives you more control on the road and makes the job of towing easier on your vehicle. My take, they're expensive, but necessary. If you're running an F-250 with a 6x10 trailer, you might not need it. But if you want to be safe on the highway in windy conditions, put the money into a good weight distribution hitch. Controversy number five, using 80-20 for the construction of cabinets and furniture in your trailer. I'm a big fan of 80-20. Used it in industry for years. Uh, we did a lot of guards on machinery, structures for testing. Uh, I've seen it used for all kinds of things. Personally, I used to be a robotics coach and we would use it for the frames of our vehicles. It is fantastic stuff. If you have a little bit of metal working ability, the stuff is easy to work with and you can buy all kinds of uh, T-nuts, bolts, hinges, connectors, everything that's necessary. It is just great stuff. I love it for so many things. I'm not a fan of it for building furniture in a cargo trailer. It does have weight. I think it's more difficult to use for the construction of cabinets and furniture. And um, I, I don't, I'm just not a fan. My biggest problem with it is the cost. 8020 is really expensive. And I know, I know there are places on the internet where you can buy uh, knockoff, off-brand kind of stuff. Still really good quality though. Um, but even at that, I just feel that 8020 is way too expensive and you shouldn't use it for that reason. Another reason is there's no real weight advantage to it. I think it's kind of improving at this point that by the time you build out with 8020, have all the corners on, all the connectors, the doors, and put all those panels in there to make it a real piece of furniture, your weight is substantial. And so I would recommend for those two reasons at the very least that you don't use 8020. Myself, I have a background in industry and education, but I'm not great with CAD. And to do 80-20, either you have to buy a whole lot of raw material and make it all yourself, or you have to lay it out using a CAD program and then have the supplier cut every piece for you. Either way, I just don't want to do that. I find that that's way more work than what I want. I like woodworking too, so that's, that's what I'm going to do. My take? go with wood. Wood is inexpensive, wood is fairly lightweight, and third, it's readily available. Controversy number six, V-nose versus flat nose. You know what I mean, the front end of your trailer. You can see I have a flat nose here, so you probably can already guess which direction I'm going to go with this. Uh, when I hear people say, hey, I, I get an extra two feet with my V-nose, you really don't, do you? Space-wise, you get an extra half of that two feet because it's a, it's a triangle and you're losing these parts out here, right? So you're really only getting that point area, and I find that to be very awkward to work with. I know some people have done a lot of really great treatments that are ingenious, but it's kind of difficult to figure out what to do with that. And it always makes me wonder, if you wanted an extra two feet, why didn't you just buy a trailer that was two feet longer? 
Another thing I've observed about V-nose trailers is that when you have that V-nose out there, your tongue area is a lot shorter. And so if you want to put something on the, that tongue, like a, a toolbox or a mini split unit, you don't have the room for it. A solution to that that I've seen quite often is to extend the tongue, make it longer. But aren't you now just back to where I started with, why don't you just buy a longer trailer? Um, up to you, totally up to you. I don't think that V makes the trailer much more aerodynamic, and I don't think you're going to be saving much in gas by having that. So my take, if you're buying a new trailer and you have a choice, go with the flat front. I'm John for John's Tech and Travel. Put your comments, and there might be a few of them on these controversies, put your comments down below. I sure do want to see them and I'll respond to as many of them as I possibly can. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. That really does help us out with the, you know, the algorithm. Until next time, learn the tech, take a trip, and enjoy the journey.